kind of a, an accident. Um, we have a palm tree in our backyard in Palo Alto, and uh, a gentleman friend of ours came over to the house and said, you know, you should make wine out of all those plums. Well, first of all, they didn't taste very good. Uh, they didn't make very good wine either, but, you know, that happens sometimes. But the, the trick is, you should have good fruit always to make good wine. And Three Lakes has some of the best cranberries you'll ever taste anywhere. And you, as you already know, Wisconsin produces more cranberries than all the other states combined. So it's a big business here. So anyway, after we made this faux pas with, uh, with the plums, we started asking friends what kind of fruit trees they have. And so John made wine for a couple of years, three, four years. And it was more interesting every time he made it. And then he made cranberry wine, and we just knew that that was the important one. So we, uh, we came back for a reunion, for his high school reunion uh, in Oshkosh, and then we came up here because he had built three cottages out on Franklin Lake. We ended up going back to Wisconsin, from Wisconsin to uh, California, loaded up a, a big van, Put, uh, put our kids in each car. <laughs> That's a very good system. <laughs> I'll tell you why, because I got lost in Minneapolis. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and John just went right on, because he thought I was right behind him. <laughs> I wasn't. So then I got on the phone with the state patrol, and he did the same thing. And so we finally found one another, <laughs> which is good. Um, and then we, we actually babysat for a house out at Franklin Lake. That's where we made the wine to start with. Uh, and we, we fell, fell in love with the people building. Just the building itself was so nice. I'm going to show you some pictures of the early days. This is what the wine would look like uh, the second year we were here. And uh, of course, we had snow on the ground. And that, that's always nice to see. Now, we had a really nice federal man that spent time with us, and uh, <clears throat> so we followed all these federal rules. Federal rules, state rules, local rules, everybody had rules, uh, which meant they all got money. That's how that works. You have rules, you get money. Uh, but this nice man who worked for the federal government, uh, before it became ATF, it was just AT, uh, firearms blew him away. He was not happy about that. But anyway, he told us about rules. And one of the rules was that we had to have a sign on every one of the tanks that, that we had. So John built the tanks out of wood. And we did that, he did that, so he could use that wood later. We lined it with polyethylene and cheating. And so you'll see it says fermentation tanks. That's what that means. That's what we did with that tank. And the next tank, you'll see, it says storage. So that's what that did. And all of these things were his rules. He said, this is what you have to do. It's all in the book. Just follow the book. You've got it made. So off comes the, the sugar. That's the first thing. It takes a lot of sugar to make wine, especially cranberry wine, because there's so little sugar in the wine, in the fruit itself. And the last thing is, this, is to have the wine all made and ready to go into tanks. Well, while we were in California, oops, these are out of sequence. Um, anyway, I'll just tell you, we, we had swimming pools. We bought children's swimming pools, which really did work nicely, except we could only get about 1,000 gallons in each of the tanks. Well, that didn't work out terribly well. Now this is where we're bottling, and I should go back so you can see what John is doing. There. He's, he's filling the, the bottles with wine. We still have the wine, the, the bottling machine. We don't use it anymore. And uh, Scott told me the other day he would never use it again, no matter what. So, <laughs> and I believe him because he makes all the wine and has for many, many years now. So. Um, We'll just see a couple of pictures of him as we go along here. Where you can see what uh, we 
the bottom of it, it has, this has legs. The, the container that's in there. So the next thing was to get tanks. And I found an ad in one of the, the journals that comes out all the time. And uh, we bought 103 of these tanks. They're all polyethylene. They don't contribute to the flavor of the wine. So whatever the wine says on the outside, that's the kind of fruit that it was made from. We don't want to change that at all. We never use oak because that's the grape wine, basically. Um, you just taste the fruit that's in it, whatever it is. There's, oh, now we got <laughs> They're just out of sequence, but that's, that's is the swimming pool. And as I said, you really couldn't get as much wine in them. But they look good. It was funny. You still get people coming and asking, where are the swimming pools? Well, they went by the wayside a long, long time ago. We got two years out of them, so we can't really complain about that. Uh, you might recognize this. I'm not sure you know him. That's Mark. He's a little boy. He's climbing the tanks. That's what happens when you have little kids. You know, they climb in the top of the tank. Right, Mark? Yes, that's yes. me. <laughs> yes. Now, the other very nice thing about having a very nice federal inspector is that he'll tell you things that aren't in the book, but you can still use that idea. And the idea was you couldn't taste wine and sell wine in the same room. Why, I have no idea, and that's changed now. But he said if I put a piece of tape on the wall, he said, this is where you taste the wine, this is where you buy the wine. That would, that would keep him happy. And gee, we want to keep him happy. <laughs> Nothing like having a disgruntled employee. So we did the same thing. Now, okay, we're out of sequence again. But this is what we call at the end of fermentation, you end up with lees, L-E-E-S. And that's what goes into distilling wine. And uh, Mark will tell me about that. But, um, so don't we, we don't drink this part. It's kind of thick and uh, it looks nice in the, in the jar, in the carboy. Now, these are signs that we used for many years. John made all these signs and uh, then Skip Wagner painted them. And he had a lot of things that he painted for us and this was just one of them. We have these on either side of the door, and we have one inside. And uh, it was nice to talk about the people. There were people who would come and say, oh, I remember when the train went through here. Um, one of the things that I like to talk about is when the train went through, uh, many years ago, they dropped off on a siding a car load, or a truck load, of uh, bottles from California for us. And uh, one of our former employees, sitting right here and down here, uh, went over there with us and she did a lot of labeling in that building. Uh, it was kind of fun to, to see that. Now, there, I don't know why this is out of sequence, but this was the, the uh, cash register that we bought for $50. If you can find a cash register for $50, you should take it. <laughs> <laughs> it worked very nicely. We pushed the button and the drawer opened. And all, the, all the money was inside. You didn't have to do anything else. That was the nice thing about that. It was very heavy. That was the bad thing. And there I am. Uh, I presume I was giving a tour or getting ready to give a tour. Um, we had a balcony in the, in the back in the fermentation area. And eventually you'll see us on, I'll come to an uh, area where <clears throat> the people were up on this balcony. They could look down and see what's happening on the floor. And it was great fun because they could get right up close to it, but they couldn't actually be on the floor with it. Now we can't do that. We just don't have the room. We're so out of space right now that uh, uh, we have bottles stored outside because we don't have room for them inside. So, but that's another story that Mark will tell you about. There's the balcony. And uh, once again, John built this. Uh, I, I remembered the other day when I was thinking about doing this, how much John built. He really was a, a finished carpenter and he did all kinds of building. Everything we had in the winery, all of the 
not only the tanks, but everything that needed to be done, this, the tasting counters. Uh, he built those, among other things, but that was a nice thing to have. And there's Scott. He's just showing off with his shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's uh, playing golf right now, so that's why he's not here. Uh, I'm also working in the yard with him. We, that we, everybody did this. There's John. He's uh, working in the yard as well. When we moved into the depot, there had been a uh, uh, an area where they stacked not only wood but other things to go into a fireplace. And the fireplace was very old and not working well, but it had it was made of bricks. And so we were able to save some of the bricks and we made a walkway, uh, a slanted walkway with those bricks. And we still do have some of those bricks out in front in, in the, the present winery. So they take a beating in the winter, unfortunately, but they're still hanging in. We have some of those bricks left. I don't know what I'm doing there, but uh, whatever it was. It had to be important, I'm sure. <laughs> And this is a picture of the winery when it was finished, when we finally got the outside looking nice, the flowers are growing. Um, it, was a, it was a very pretty time. And there's Scott again. He has a shirt on this time, uh, although he is still rolling up the bags. Uh, I made a whole bunch of bags out of nylon material, and we pumped the wine <clears throat> into the bag and then roll it up on the bar, and it would drip down and go into a, into a barrel. And we, that's the one thing that they still do at the winery. It goes back to the early era. Um, and this is a press that we used for many, many years. It's a small press, but it was made really for uh, pressing just three or four bags at a time. But we did, as you can see, we filled it right to the top. And we put the top down and, and did the pressing. We have a stainless steel tank now that we use for, for pressing. Very, very much changed. There's the press and you can see the lid on the top. <coughs> um, now these tanks came in when I was already retired. <laughs> but uh, we've had them a long time. We have a lot of them. And uh, that's part of our problem is that we don't have enough room for all of the wine that we're making right now. The first year we were in business, we made 3,000 gallons of wine, which I thought was an enormous amount of wine. <laughs> Turns out that was hardly anything at all. Now we're making 65,000 gallons a year. So we've come a long ways in 45 years. Now this is the bottle machine. And the uh, gentleman right there, this is Charlie Simkowski. I don't know if you know Charlie. He's been with the winery for 30 some odd years. And uh, he knows where every bottle of wine is. When you ask him for something, he knows exactly where it is. He uh, knows the lawn. He does whatever you need done. He'll do it. Um, and then in the next shot, you can see Mark right back there. I don't know what he's laughing about, but something. Uh, something important, right, Mark? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, he's giving a tour. I think this was Cranberry Fest when he was giving tours. but. Uh, um, that he's leaning on the press. This is another one of the many beautiful things that uh, Skip Wagner did for us. Um, he painted this, this sign. And it had to go by the wayside because we didn't have enough room. Again, we were running out of room. And it was too bad to, to bring that down. But we had, a, we, we had it for about three years. And, uh, when we, is taking up space that was needed for parking. And this is our last shot. This is a picture of Christmas. And it was the Christmas after we opened. So we've been around for 45 years, and we've been good years. We really have. I thank you for your patience with me. And if you have a question, I'd be happy to try to answer it. No questions? OK. <laughs> Yes, it was. Right. Uh, and there were tracks along the side. Um, when we had the tank, when they brought the, the uh, carload of bottles, 
they just put it off to a siding, which was just a little ways off, not that. And then two years after that, they took the tracks out. <coughs> it went down the street like this. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you get all your fruits locally? No. Um, where, where the cranberries are all Wisconsin grown. Right. Okay? And they're always frozen. We never use fresh cranberries. Actually, we don't use anything fresh except wild plums. Where else do you get uh, your fruit from? Um, it comes from all over the United States. Depends on where, where, where the broker can get the best deal for us. And Poland. Elderberries come from Poland. Oh, yes. Elderberries come from Poland. This is a current employee. <laughs> <laughs> No worries. Oh, yes. How long did it take for the idea of cranberry wine or wine in Three Lakes catch on and have people coming in and asking for tours and stuff? Well, I tell you, I bought a little book for guests. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, we put it out the first day, and it was full within three days. So um, apparently it, was, it has worked out well. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. How did people find out about you in the beginning? Um, word of mouth, I think, mostly to start with. Now, of course, we're on Facebook and you know, all of the social media, and, and we do a lot of wholesale. So things have changed a lot. But when you buy a bottle of wine at the laundry, and it's a blend of two wines, those are finished wines that are blended just before they bottle. So every flavor of the fruit comes through. Any other questions? Okay. I, oh, yes. I, I'll, I'll just add one. You should uh, also comment that what's in the wine? Water, sugar, yeast, and fruit? And that's it? <laughs> the wine is made from water, sugar, yeast, and fruit, and nothing else? That's right, yeah. Uh, it's fruit, sugar, yeast, that's all. The fruit, the sugar, the yeast, that's all we make wine out of. Yes, ma'am. How did you come to pick the people? That I think we just fell in love with the off the building. It was just, it's just kind of iconic. We drove past it the first time, and John said, oh, look, there's the people building. And then there was somebody else renting it at the time. And uh, I think we both just sat down and said, you know, of all the buildings we looked at, that just struck us as the place we wanted to be. Yeah. And could you comment about moving from Three Lakes to Eagle River and back uh, Well, we just we only had a six-year lease, uh, and when it came to the end of the lease, uh, they weren't going to sell it to us, so uh, we had to move to Eagle River. And Jerry McKeever built the building for us in Eagle River. We were there for ten expensive years. And we were finally able to purchase the building, and uh, well, that's why we were here. Any other questions? Okay, I'll turn this over to Mark, who's going to tell you lots of good things. I'll do it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I guess I have 20 minutes. Uh, it's a lot to fit in there. I've been trying to figure out exactly how to um, kind of convey this to you. Um, I think what I'll do is just kind of tell you how I got uh, started. Of course, you saw the pictures of me a little bunch can run around the winery. I kind of grew up there. It was just, it was just natural. The winery was the winery. And so it was kind of my place to play and come home after school and watch the Three Stooges and then go run around with the friends. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was kind of my life. Um, worked there a little bit, uh, you know, through high school. Worked the Northern Air. Worked here and there. Um, but like so many uh, teenagers, uh, they get grown up and ready to graduate, they want to get out of here. And that's a very common theme, and I was among them. So I took off back to my, um, where I was born, uh, California. Uh, and I uh, won't bore you with that story, but basically I survived my 20s um, and uh, had always been in contact with my uh, family here. Made numerous visits back to Three Lakes, and always loved Three Lakes. And, um, 
um, kind of was in three lake or in California when the population went from uh, 20 million to 30 million, and kind of said, okay, I think I'm done with California. Um, I really would like to get back to three lakes, and uh, had been talking to my family about uh, the business. I'm kind of like a, a hyperactive business guy. And uh, my family, my mother is a great hostess. My dad was, uh, he's been described by our family, some other family members as kind of a tinkerer. And so he was always building things and fixing things and creating things. And then my brother Scott is kind of um, just brilliant, uh, steady, uh, just uh, amazing. And so uh, now we're partners in the business, uh, bought out on dad and so on. And, uh, so Scott and I um, kind of teamed up. That's kind of a bit later. But anyway, um, so I came back in uh, 1992. I quit what I was doing out there, decided to take uh, many, many months off to go mess around and go to Europe and do stuff I hadn't done, like some of the people do. Um, didn't go to college and everything like that. So I kind of thought, like, well, I need to do some of those things that people do when they go to college. So I went to Europe. Um, but where I got started with wine is kind of an interesting story, actually. I, my dad, I was traveling out east uh, to go visit some friends, and I was going to be going through Milwaukee, and uh, he said, hey, on your way, would you mind dropping off some wine? And they had a few, of course, the, they had the winery people, and they also had a few wholesale accounts, the grocery stores, liquor stores, and that kind of thing, um, but just a few. And, uh, my dad said, uh, hey, would you drop off some wine in Brookfield? Some of you may know, uh, remember uh, Brennan's. Um, they're no longer in business, but uh, a great little farmer market type of grocery store. And uh, so I said, yeah, sure. So I threw them in my car and, uh, and dropped them off. And, and I sat a conversation with this guy who was there. I, was, I still remember this. Kevin Grace was his name. And I said, uh, oh, we were unloading the boxes and so on. And I said, so I mean, how does the wine do? He said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, I mean, how does it sell? He said, well, this is five cases of wine. That's 60 bottles. He said, well, and this, I don't know what day of the week it was, but he said, this will be gone in about three days. And I said, uh, why did you only get five cases of wine? He said, well, that's all I can get. And I said, oh, okay. And it sells really well, right? He said, yeah, people absolutely love it. So the whole trip out to Baltimore, and then a week or two out there, and I came back. Um, the whole time I'm thinking, okay, I got to turn this on. <laughs> so um, both my dad and and my brother Scott had already tried kind of getting out and selling the wine wholesale, and, and they had some some luck, but it was not their thing. Uh, my dad was not a salesman, and Scott was definitely not a salesman. <laughs> You know Scott, you know he's not a salesman. <laughs> Brilliant guy, but not a salesman. So I'm not much of a salesman either, but um, but I, uh, I'm kind of confident, but maybe even overconfident. And so, but I knew the product and uh, kind of grew up with it. And uh, so I came back and uh, sat down with my family and I said, hey, what do you guys think about this? <laughs> I won't bore you with all the details, but they said, no. Bad idea. It will never work. Don't do it. <laughs> But I said, no, I want to do it. Um, so made a deal with them. Again, won't worry about all the details, but I, I won the deal. I uh, won the bet, kind of. And uh, so what basically I did was, uh, the packaging was very um, uh, plain. Uh, you all know what a UPC code is. That's the barcode scan. We didn't have that on the bottle. So it's really difficult to get into the grocery stores, liquor stores, without that. So. Plus, we had, we had issues with, um, I mean, most of the, the vast majority, probably 95% of the wine was sold right at the winery, and my mother and the other uh, employees there could explain to people that these were natural fruit wines. They had a short shelf life, and enjoy it. Take it home and enjoy it. They're not, they're not great wines. They don't have the same chemistry. They don't have tannin, tannic acid, which is a natural preservative. They're just fruit wines. So, Take them home and enjoy them. Well, that's a little bit of a trick to get through the, the grocery stores and liquor stores because they need a longer shelf life. So I went to Scott and I said, 
what do you need to do to figure out how to make the shelf life extend? He said, well, I don't know, give me some winemaking books. So I went and bought winemaking books, a whole bunch of them. And he read them, and he figured out how to um, do some things with filtration and um, some other natural uh, things that you could do in winemaking um, that hadn't been done in the past, and we extended the shelf life. I uh, went to um, figure out how to get a UPC code. Um, you, the, the, uh, there's a council that manages UPC code, so I figured that out. And then I went to a label printer, and we got labels printed with UPCs, and then I went back to the grocery stores and said, here, look, <laughs> now we can buy it. And uh, they did, like crazy, it was awesome. And so that was my job. I spent, uh, I was, uh, I'm into my 26th year now. I was 92 when I came back. and. Uh, at the time, um, for, so uh, my mother said 3,000 uh, gallons, which is I don't know, about 1, 12, 1,300 cases of wine. Um, that's boutique. If you've ever been to California and Napa, there's a lot of small boutique wineries. That's all they do, 1,000, 2,000 cases. And that's it. Of course, they're selling them for 800 bucks a case. But, <laughs> a little different world. but. Um, Still very small, mom and pop, um, and so that production level stayed pretty steady. Uh, it worked maybe 2,500, 3,000 cases, maybe four or 5,000 when we were up in Eagle River because there was more square footage there to deal with. And so when I came back, it was very small, um, but I, I needed more production because I was out selling to grocery stores and liquor stores. Um, and back in those days, we could sell directly to them. Now we have to go through distributors. But um, so we, um, we uh, just, I started buying land, the old railroad property, and uh, uh, begging, borrowing, and stealing money, not stealing, <laughs> begging, begging and borrowing and everything else to buy land, because I knew what I wanted to do, but I just, you know, got to go one step at a time. So um, we developed the, the uh, kind of a solid uh, market in the wholesale, we continued to grow uh, the winery. And actually, it was a very interesting cycle that we saw developing, is the more that we developed the wholesale market in uh, Milwaukee, Madison, and you know, the bigger cities, Fox Valley, and so on, the, the, the more traffic we saw in the winery. It kind of makes sense, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't evident that that's what was going to happen. Now, in retrospect, it was very crystal clear. So the more we were selling out there, the more people came through like, to see the winery, and, and so on. So it kind of grew from there. So now we, um, over those, all those years, um, we went from, I had a team of salesmen with delivery vans running all over the place selling it. And then they changed the law and we had to deal with distributors. Actually, that came a little bit later. We were actually approached by a distributor because we had done a pretty good job getting the product out there and <coughs> developing a brand um, that had you know, value to a distributor. Um, so they took over the product and then, <laughs> side story, but they quickly lost the market share, so I fired them, <laughs> and I went back to work doing it myself, and uh, that went on for another three, four years. Then they changed the law, and we were kind of wondering, well, what are we going to do here? And uh, Badger Liquor approached us, and uh, the, the owner of the company said, hey, I'm really sorry we screwed it up the first time, but uh, we won't do that again. And so he made some promises, and they have been a very, very good uh, uh, team for us. They, they do all of the distribution. So uh, last year we sold about 22,000 cases. So we've, we've had like 8 or 9 percent growth. Uh, it started to plateau a couple years ago because as my mother said, we've run out of space. Um, which is a great problem to have. I'm not complaining by the way. It's all very good. But uh, so that's kind of, uh, I, can, I can go on and on and on about all kinds of very interesting things about the, the development business, but just to kind of summarize, uh, we've grown, uh, I wouldn't say rapidly, because rapid growth can actually kind of mess you up sometimes, but we've had steady growth, um, and uh, that's what I prefer, actually. So what we're, what we're looking at now, I, I kind of took a little break, and some of you may know about this uh, uh, five years ago or so, um, in fact, five years ago right now. Uh, Kind of went on a little adventure with the kind of development stuff. The hardware store fell in my lap, and some other businesses, and so on. So I own a couple of businesses here in town. 
And so I kind of took a break, not took a break completely from the winery the operation itself. I mean, I still have been running it and managing it. Scott and I, by the way, we have Neil, my brother Scott. He makes the wine. That's it. He doesn't have to do anything else. Just make the wine. I order the fruit, the sugar, and the chemicals, whatever he needs as far as yeast and so on. I do the hiring and occasionally firing. Don't like that, but it has to happen sometimes. Um, uh, everything. I do everything except make the wine, and that's all he wants to do, by the way. He doesn't want to have to do anything else. So it's a good deal, actually. It works out very nicely for both of us, because I frankly don't want to make the wine either. Um, or I don't want to make the wine. So, um, yeah, so where we're at right now is I, have, I took this kind of a break to do some development stuff, which has actually worked very well. I'm not doing hardware store really, but it's, it's a it's working, the hardware store is a good business. Got that fixed, it took, took a long time. Uh, it took a long time to get that fixed, but it's working. And uh, so now I'm kind of um, shifting, I'm still distracted by some of these other businesses, but there, it's, it's, it's a, I can tell you it's a, it's a labor of love. Uh, Three Lakes is, uh, I'm very serious, Three Lakes enthusiast. Uh, it's a lovely town, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to do everything I can to see it. Uh, maintain its quaint beauty and smallness, actually. But uh, the winery um, is quite a, a fascinating thing. It's, it's actually, um, I don't even consider it, I even know Scott and I am 50-50 um, now, I don't even consider it mine. Um, it's like I, I don't care about that whole possession ownership stuff. It's, it's, like, it's like something other than me, it has nothing to do with me really, it's just like I'm, I'm kind of moving it along, <laughs> but it's this entity that my parents started, and so many awesome employees are, <laughs> I, um, along, I mean literally, probably at least a thousand employees over the 46 years have gone through there. A lot of them um, work for many, many years, uh, you know, high school, college, sometimes even after that, just come through and really contributed great ideas and uh, made the place just like totally into the community. I love that. And uh, so I feel kind of an obligation. I got to keep this baby going because it's so important uh, to so many people. And, and I'm not saying that people tell me how much they love the wine. So we're going to embark on a rather um, huge uh, project. Uh, multi-million dollar uh, expansion that is going to include the distillery. Um, and some of you, I, some people, when I say distillery, what comes to mind is, is brewing beer, but it's not. Um, distil distillation is when you heat up a mash or, or even a wine, if you want to make a brand, you heat it up and um, the, the vapors um, are condensed. And some of them, uh, Distillation. We talk about that for hours. It's a fascinating process, but basically, it's it's uh, distilling the alcohol out of whatever it may be. In the case of whiskey, for example, we use it, uh, one way of doing it is a corn mash, um, where they uh, convert the, <coughs> convert the carbohydrates into uh, fer uh, fermentable um, sugars, basically. And then you make a 7-8% alcohol mash, and that goes into a kettle, you heat it up. Um, and by the way, alcohol boils, uh, it vaporizes at a much lower temperature than water, so the water stays there uh, in the mash. And the, the alcohol and the other compound, there's a lot of other, like VOCs, both uh, volatile organic compounds, will, it, uh, will uh, vaporize and uh, go through the rectification tower and all of the parts of the, of the, uh, the distillery equipment. And then you have different sections of, uh, you have what's called the heads, the heart, I'm going to go into detail because it's fascinating actually. The heads, the hearts, and the, the tails, the heads are like acetone, you know, like the fingernail polish remover, nasty stuff, right? And a whole bunch of other compounds. Those come off first, and so you, as you're distilling, uh, the next stage is uh, what they call the hearts. The heart is the consumable alcohol. 
and then the tails are kind of diluted um, stuff that gets to be uh, redistilled. Anyway, that's what happens. That's a very condensed version, version in uh, what the, in the industry they call the distillery. That's the, the whole kit, uh, the whole piece of equipment. It's quite, if you've ever seen a distillery, in some cases, if it's built, sometimes it's built um, in such a way that they're really gorgeous copper, shiny copper, and kettles and everything. So anyway, we're going to do that. The, we're going to build that, um, and it's it's not cheap. The, the, the whole kit, which is called a distillery, um, is somewhere between four hundred and six hundred thousand dollars for the equipment. And uh, but that's actually cheap compared to the building. <laughs> um, we're, right now, we're we're at maximum maximum capacity. We're actually can adjust capacity a little bit by moving holes around, <laughs> which we've done as much as we can do. Um, so, but part of it's related to our equipment. So what I want to do is build, I want to build a building that fits in three lakes. So it's not going to be some industrial, awful looking structure. We're going to, we're going to actually, somebody said our building is beautiful. I think it's cute. It's nice, uh, but we're going to make it even nicer. Um, but we're also, so we're going to have a very nice retail space. Uh, Bigger than what we have now, we have, a, again, it's a capacity problem in the, the retail space. And we're also going to uh, expand the uh, production and warehousing space because, as I said, we, we, we sell about 20, 21, 22,000 cases of wine. That's about a quarter million bottles. Um, I don't have any interest. Uh, my interest is in Three Lakes. Uh, I want to see Three Lakes become sustainable and, and flourish. Um, without becoming, you know, sprawled all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah, well, I'm not alone then, good. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm actually, uh, that's, that's kind of, uh, I don't know if you want to say it's a life mission, but that's what I'm working on. Um, uh, so the, quite, quite fr put it quite bluntly actually, the money comes from the winery and the distillery, the rest of it, there's no money in it, but I don't care. Uh, it's about building the town. But, uh, I want to build up the winery and build the distillery up so that it's a gorgeous, landmark, beautiful facility, but not too big, just enough to be able to do all the things that we want to do. Um, I want to get our production up to no more than a million bottles of wine. And it sounds like a lot, but actually it's still a small winery uh, in comparison. And then uh, when it comes to the spirits, I want to do the whole range of spirits, the whiskeys, rye, bourbon, um, something called an eau de vie. I don't know if any of you have heard of an eau de vie. It's a European style brandy. It's colorless. And we make fruit wine, so it's a natural to make uh, eau de vies. Um, most eau de, vie, eau de vies come from France. Uh, they're big on that, and, and they're usually made from a pear, uh, apples, um, plums, cherries. Um, and we're going to do that. We're going to make a cranberry over the. I don't even know if a cranberry over the exists, but we're going to do it. It's going to be fun. Um, we're also going to make gin. Uh, we're going to do. We're going to do some um, really interesting uh, uh, infusions uh, with gin. People don't drink a lot of gin. It only represents 12 percent of uh, spirit consumption. I don't care. We're still going to do it. It'll be fun. Um, what other, what other, what other? Some potatoes, because I want to make, uh, I want to have uh, small potatoes, vodka, that would be fun, right? Yes. Um, potato it. vodka is actually very difficult to make. Um, uh, converting the, car, uh, the, the uh, starches in potatoes to fermentable uh, sugars is a, uh, it's a complex process. And uh, it's done, of course, but it's, uh, I, I'm looking forward to the challenge. It'll be a lot of fun. So anyway, that's on the distillery. That's going to be, it's kind of, for me, I, I, like, the mechan I like the challenge of doing it, probably more than anything. Um, so that's going to be a great project. And I, don't, I do not want to make an industrial-sized distillery. I have no interest in it. Uh, my interest is, as I said, it's in three lights. I want to keep it small, keep it fun. I want to have what's called craft distillation. So, but you can still be craft and make a pretty, uh, my distributors, um, <laughs> by the way, I can't afford not to do this, by the way, my distributors are like begging for the Three Lakes Stillery product. I said, guys, I don't even have a permit yet, but I've been talking to them about it because I want to make sure that I have 
uh, distillate, or, excuse me, distribution all set up. Now, as far as the winery goes, um, wow, uh, it's like so exciting. There's so many opportunities if I just had more room. And so we're going to build it because we want to expand our offerings. Uh, we want to get into tiny bottles, which is very popular today, uh, but we don't have the room for the equipment uh, to do that. And I really don't like the idea of farming off bottling to anybody. I like to bottle my own stuff. I know it's a very common thing, plug and play and farm it off. I don't like to do that. We like to do it ourselves. So we're going to do that kind of thing. Um, different varieties of grapes, uh, excuse me, different varieties of fruit we're going to be bringing in. We actually do, I mentioned grapes because I was thinking about it. We bring in what we call raw grape wine. This is, this is wine that has been uh, Grapes have been harvested and, the, the, and, and uh, processed and fermented into kind of a uh, very simple, I call it raw, bulk wine. And we bring some of that in, not huge amounts, but we bring some of it in because it's, I mean, it's wine. It's, it's some of it, Cabernet Sauvignon and uh, Pinot Grigio, some of these others, really wonderful French varietals. They blend very nicely with our fruit wines. If anybody, any of you have ever had our black cab, very popular. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice blend. It's the the the, the, cran or the uh, blackberry itself is a. Uh, to answer, there was a question about where we get our fruit. Uh, um, I'm, we're very particular about the fruit, um, and I can't get it all locally. There's just not enough production. Um, and, and quite frankly, uh, the, I can't sell a bottle of our wine for twenty-five dollars a bottle. It's it's uh, it's fruit wine. It's. Um, uh, I, I just wouldn't be able to do it. I have to keep, I have to be real about what we can sell the wine for. So I would love to be able to buy the blueberries from a little farmer over here who produces 500 pounds, but that's not enough. That I can't, I can't do anything with that. And plus, they're going to be three, four dollars a pound, which is going to be a twenty-two dollar box. So there is a practical economic uh, element to. I mean, we're a for-profit business. I, I think you all get that. <laughs> but we also go only after the highest quality fruit, which can be challenges. Challenge, very challenging. Sometimes we run out of stuff. Right in, pull. <laughs> we run out. But I'm not going to compromise. So anyway, we just uh, that's one of my jobs is to uh, try to find the highest quality fruit. And uh, I actually, said, I, I got 2,500 pounds of blueberry or uh, strawberries in. It was, a, it was last fall. We opened it up and the strawberries tasted like cardboard. Cardboard. So I got on the phone and I said, "You can have them back." <laughs> right. So I stored them for a while and then he came and got them and then we ended up getting the most gorgeous, wonderful strawberries. I wanted to eat the box myself. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah. Sometime uh, you know, check when we're, we have fruit coming in. You're welcome to come in and try the fruit. It's amazing. Um, but I want to continue that. Do some blending with some grape wines and also I would like to be able to have enough room. There's a, believe it or not, there's a lot of, there's a, Wisconsin has become a cranberry, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, fumbling over my words here, it has become a, a grape growing region uh, for whole pine grapes in the southern part of the state. And then you can grow some, um, some grapes here to the, to, the, uh, to the west of here. And uh, whether or not you subscribe to uh, the uh, science of climate change, I don't get political, but it's real. And if things are changing, and they're in France, talk to, talk to France about climate change. They'll tell you all about it. <laughs> they're pulling up vines like crazy because they don't grow there anymore and they, in certain regions, and that's happening in Wisconsin too. They're finding out all kinds of varieties now are starting to, to move north. So I want to take advantage of that, take some wine, right? So we want to have the room to be able to buy. Uh, we're not going to grow grapes, although, man, there is a chunk of land here. <laughs> sure, it would be fun, but um, yeah, I'd like to be able to buy grapes and we could make our own grape wines out of Wisconsin grapes. Uh, we could also make some wonderful uh, Wisconsin brandy from these grapes. I think it would be spectacular. I, I, these are dreams now until I have the room. So uh, where I'm at now is just, uh, I formed a company. It's called the Capital Three Lakes. Uh, it's uh, just an equity company, and I'm going to use that to draw in capital, uh, about $6 million, uh, to take care of it. 
do my expansion of the winery, um, do the uh, buy the equipment for the uh, distillery. Um, again, we have four acres right there, that whole Three Lakes winery property, about four acres. Some of you uh, know the Tree Hugger building. Tree Hugger was my little fun little hobby for a while. Uh, but that was just to, I wanted to see if it would work. And uh, it's, it, it, uh, it was fun, but uh, I need that property now. <laughs> so that building is going to go away. And we'll, uh, that'll be parking in front of the new winery. But we're going to keep it all contained on that 40 acre chunk of property and make it even more beautiful with, uh, some of you noticed we planted some trees. Lots of flowers, especially this time of year, it's gorgeous, so all the blossoms. We'll have walking trails around the property. The, the lot across the street, some of you uh, know that vacant lot used to be the lunary. Um, it was actually in one of those photos there. It was uh, that, that lunary building had been an old theater years and years ago, a really cool building. Uh, but anyway, I have cleaned up that property. Um, don't even ask me how much I spent fixing that up, <laughs> but it's it's ready for development. Um, that would be parking, but I also want to make it uh, more than just a plain old, you know, cave over paradise or whatever the song says. We want to make it a, a really nice uh, kind of a how would you say it? like like a rest stop maybe, um, a place where people can have a picnic, uh, uh, to walk the dog. Are there? Art fairs, yeah, actually, for farmers markets. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm going to develop that into, again, not just pave it over. It's going to be a gorgeous place, landscape, but it'll give us additional parking. We don't have any place for people with RVs or even the fishing boats. You know, they have to swing around trying to figure out where to park. You've got to have room. We're a car society. It's just the way it is. We got to have room for them. And we live. In, I expect when we build the distillery and have our expanded uh, winery and so on. Uh, well, you know, hopefully we get a few more people coming in and they need a place to park. Um, so again, the, the, I, the capital of Three Lakes, this is the, the company that I formed um, because I need capital too for some of the other redevelopment that I want to do. I'm, I really do want to fix up Three Lakes. We've, sadly, some, um, this will be kind of the last thing I say. I know I should, I'll show you. <laughs> So um, I'm going on an adventure, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to go one building at a time, and I'm going to bring them up in standards. I'm going to keep them cute and nice, and not uh, looking like no naming, I'm not naming any other towns, but some of our neighboring towns that have kind of gone the way of maybe the small box and even the big box route. I just don't, I don't see that for three lakes. I, I think that would mess us up. I think that would really mess up three lakes if we went down the road of just. <laughs> we, I, I want to keep three lakes small, um, but it needs to stay alive. <laughs> we've got a school district, uh, we've got all of this stuff. So uh, uh, I have a plan. I, I probably get in trouble for talking about it uh, uh, here um, like this. But anyway, I got a plan. And um, the, the winery distillery is the way that I'm going to be financing it. Um, so we'll buy some wine. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, the other town, other part, other buildings and so on, I'm just going to go one at a time. I'm going to fix them up. Because here, I'll leave you with this concept. I don't think we, I, I think it's really important that we, we not just focus in on today and what we need right now in front of us. I think if we, if you have 
the capacity to do it, and I'm a little overconfident sometimes. I think I have the capacity to do some things. I think we should not just do it for right now, today, even just even for my own kids. I think we need to be thinking, you know, my kids' kids and the next generation, two down, two or three generations down the road. Think about this: the 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 sewer and the water systems, the, the storm drain, um, the roads that we have. Do you think we could agree to build everything that we have right now? I don't think we could. We fight over the damnedest little things. <laughs> but somehow, you know, 60, 70, uh, 50, 60 years ago, they figured out how to do it all, and they all cooperated. I think we need to do a little bit more of that yes. so that we don't let the town crumble apart. And so, I, I, you know, anyway, that's what I'm going to be working on. So. Yeah, the library is a great project, right? Everybody's behind it. Right. We want to make it happen, and um, I think we need, to, you know, all the more. Look at the Black Forest. That family over there. Yes. Holy cow! That building. I was afraid it was going to go away, right? Yeah. How it was closed for what two summers, and then the fam that beautiful family comes in, and they they know how. That's the, they got the trick right, right? They got the, the business to be awesome, but then they took the surplus and put it back into the building. Instead of just taking the money out and investing it in Wall Street so they can go build a big box and then, you know, right? They put it right back in, but it's lovely. We're going to do the same thing here. So, anyway. Yeah, there you go. Questions? Anyway, that's, uh, that's kind of my. I can go on. Questions? Yes. No, does anyone have a question? Oh. <coughs> I did. Questions? Okay. Well, no, 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 wait, wait. Answer it in I yes. got a question. Obviously, with you trying to keep it local and that, uh, yeah. going public is out of your thought process, right? Uh, going public? Going public. Uh, well, yeah, the, the Capital Three Lakes is going to be, uh, I'm working on what's called a, a private placement offering memorandum. It, it, it's, it's equivalent to a prospectus. Prospectus is for a publicly, right. like an IPO. Right. Um, this is going to be tiny, six million. I know it sounds like a lot of money, and it's a, not chump change for me. <laughs> it's a pile of money, but in the world of investment, six million is like usually that's what they pay the attorney, <laughs> right, to write this right. stuff up. So, but um, yeah, it's it's a it's a private placement. What? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That beautiful little orchard that you put in, <laughs> blossoming yeah. flowers. Did you put that in at one point thinking you might use some fruit to make wine? Um, it couldn't produce enough fruit uh, really to to make enough wine to um, even 160 trees is tiny for our production. It sounds kind of ridiculous, but it is. I did it because I just love trees. I'm a tree hunter, right? So <laughs> this is called tree hunting. No, I did, I did that because that property, the old railroad property, was really quite ugly in many ways. And we cleaned it up as much as we could, but I just decided, you know, there's it's still a business and it's got a back with garbage cans and loading docks and all that. So I thought, well, we just plant some trees. <laughs> Why not? And so they're beautiful. With the, blooms, uh, the blooms right now are beautiful. But yeah, we'll, we'll actually we'll take the fruit and we'll... Uh, we'll do something with it. We'll sell it or, or make juice or have the kids come from school and pick apples. Well, thank, yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. thank you. Did you do? Yeah, thank you. Do you have a time on? Yes, I do, actually. Um, you want to hear it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the, the, I have, it's a, there's uh, three five year phases the first five years of building and development. The second year is investment, what I call investment maturation. That's the building is mostly done in the five years. For, for investors, they want to know if they're going to make any money. So the, there's five years. Uh, and then I have a five year exit plan because I'm very, very, very conservative uh, in, that, in those terms. And you got anybody that's going to invest wants to know how they're going to get it out. So you got to have an exit plan. And so I've got a very elaborate, uh, if you like spreadsheets, Come on, we'll go check out the spreadsheets. Uh, very elaborate plan for an exit, um, five-year exit plan. So 15 years, I'm 53, so I'll be pushing 70, and I'll hopefully accomplish something. Awesome. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah. 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 It takes time, though. It, you got to have a plan, though, because you can't. Here's the other thing is, it's not going to happen automatically. If you're going to sit and wait for somebody to come along and, you know, fix things, um, you're going to wait all the time. you gotta, you got to make it happen. Um, I have this conversation with people that, like, for example, we have affordable housing problem in Three Lakes, right? I mean, I get phone calls regularly because I have four units that we rent out, and I could rent out a hundred as many phone calls as you can get. Um, so we have an affordable housing problem. That's part of my plan is to, to, uh, to I don't want to build, by the way, Section 8 type um, housing developments. I don't think that's appropriate for Three Lakes. I think single family dwellings are ideal. We need more of them that are affordable, you know. Uh, three, four hundred thousand dollar lakes on a house, or houses on the lakes are great for people that can pull that off, but um, a teacher in Three Lakes um, may not be able to pull that off. So what do they need? They need a thousand square foot house, or they need to, you know, a nice duplex, and I mean nice, not some, you know, junk. Um, so let's, let's do it. Let's build it. And so that's what I'm going to do.